What we're going to talk about is Art Nouveau. I'm going to take you from what I see as the foundations in about the 1780s through to when it fell into disrepute and decline and finished at the start of the, the First World War. Um, and when I was researching this, you come across some quite interesting stories. And there's a, <coughs> there's a story of a, in the 1870s of a struggling artist called Jeremiah McNulty, who was starving because he couldn't sell any of his paintings. And his friend <coughs> suggested that he should go down to a gallery and stand the commission and pay it. He was very reluctant to do this, but in the end he went and he gave all his paintings to the gallery owner. And the gallery owner said, come back in a couple of months and we'll see what's happened. So he dutifully came back in a, a couple of months. He said, how's things? And the gallery owner said, um, we have some good news and some bad news for you. And I said, well, what's the good news? So the good news is that a couple of days ago, a gentleman came in and took one look at your painting. He said, I really like those. Who is it by? So I said, oh, it's Jeremiah McNulty. And he said, uh, will they appreciate I said to him, well, not really, not until he's dead. And he said, I'll have the lot. And he said, and he bought the lot. So they, Jeremiah said, well, that is good news. He said, what's the bad news? He said, apparently he's your doctor. <laughs> <laughs> right, Art Nouveau. This is a, a typical Art Nouveau style, which you, you can see with the following, and what is called the curvilinear form. This is actually a cheat. This is a poster by Alphonse Mucker called The Dance and it should in fact be that way up. But it just looks better when it fills the screen that way around. Now, Art Nouveau um, started off with that kind of form, but essentially in the end it became a brand. <coughs> it became such a popular art form that anybody who was painting basically called it Art Nouveau. And some of the things we'll look at will bear little resemblance to this. Let me just take you through what we're going to look at. So the first thing we will look at the foundations and we'll start off with William Blake and Fuseli and mysticism. And then the influence of Japan and how Japan influenced the Western artists in the 1850s, 60s and 70s. And indeed Arabia. All these were fundamental influences on Art Nouveau. It was also a literary movement. And so we'll look at Keats and the Romantic poets, and particularly medievalism uh, and the pre-Raphaelite brotherhood. And then a wonderful man, William Morris, who started the arts and crafts movement. So that's the foundations. And then we'll look at the actual building blocks. And there were three distinct movements which influenced Art Nouveau artists quite strongly. One was symbolism, and this is an artistic movement that came out of Europe, and it basically is what you say on the tin. Every painting, every piece of literature had a symbol, a symbolism to it. We'll look at the decadence movement, which again came out of Europe, you couldn't imagine the decadence <laughs> movement coming out of the UK, could you? I mean, we're not that decadent, are we? I don't know about you, what? Right? <laughs> um, and then aestheticism, led by Oscar Wilde, and we all know what happened to poor <coughs> Oscar. Mm -hmm. Then we'll look at some of the early forms, the identifiable, the identifiable early forms of Art Nouveau and the artistic revolution that it caused. It was basically a movement which displaced the traditional art movement and swept it to one side and took over. And then finally, we'll look at just some of the absolutely stunning paintings, sculptures and such like of Art Nouveau. <laughs> so let's begin at the beginning. And a little introduction to understanding art and art criticism. This is a painting by Henry Fuseli. And it was painted for his, well, his lover, basically, Anna Leibholz. Now, Fuseli never made any comment on this painting. 
but the art critic decided that what this painting represented was that this was the female orgasm, this was the male libido, and this was the bulging eyes with the suppressed sexual desire. As I say, Fuseli never made any comment on it, but it was so popular that he made lots and lots of copies of this painting, and it in fact made his, uh, his life. It, it actually made him quite a rich man. So this was a period in Paris where life was gay. Everybody was excited. And along came um, Bing and opened up, lo and behold, the amazing Art Nouveau and was bringing in artistic objects. The, the, the form hadn't really been formed, but the name was there. And then, at the same time that was going on, <coughs> Sarah Bernhardt um, ruled the roost on the, well, really on the European stage. And she had this, um, the play that she was doing, Bismondo, and she had no publicity material. And she'd gone into the printers at Christmas Eve, and Mucker was there just checking proofs and, and stuff like that to earn a bit of money. And she had a go at the printer about where's this poster. And Mucker offered to do a poster. He did that in a couple of days, took it to Sarah. She was delighted with it. She reckoned that he had captured her soul, as she said. That poster was then started to be put up in Paris and it caused an absolute sensation. As fast as they were put up, people were stealing them. Again, because nothing like it had been seen before. Let's just have a look at some Fergus and you're allowed to go, wow, how about this? <laughs> isn't that stunning? I mean, you just look at that and I think two things. One is, isn't that beautiful? And the other question they ask themselves is, how did he make it? How on earth did he make that? Kind of, and that was Copine's speciality, which was um, <coughs> my favourite piece of all time, and I'll explain why. <coughs> this is by a guy called Peter Behrens, who went on to found the Bauhaus, and in fact became the world's first industrial designer. And that suite, this is bronze, that suite there follows the scientific golden section. So it's actually a mathematical model which he was using. But I just think that is just absolutely beautiful. And you can trace it back to, remember the grave digger? With the, you can trace it back to that kind of thing going on. Here's another one you can say wow to. And when Lalique was asked, is this the kind of thing I should buy for my wife? He said, no, 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 your mistress. <laughs> One that shows the Egyptian, again, it was used in adverts and all sorts of things because it made money. The, you can see the North African and Egyptian here, the headdress and the amulet, you know, that could be Cleopatra in many ways. And if you just look at the formation of this, the way that H <coughs> is written, and then compare it to, just look at the delicacy of that 